sound of Universal Broadcasting Network. Anywhere. This is your sound. This is the sound of Universal Broadcasting Network at UBNRadio.com. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Focus with Ronnie Frierson. We started a little bit late today. Blame it on technology. We love technology, but blame it. So welcome again to all of our viewers and listeners from around the country and around the world. I am happy to be here. Um, I am your host, Ron Frierson. Um, Like I do every week, I like to first start off the show with my take on some specific issue. And my issue for this week is the debates in our political season. So my take on the debates, the uh, Democratic debates that happened earlier this week, I believe they were on Tuesday, I think it's a media spectacle. Um, we have gotten to a point now where our political system is primarily based on entertainment. The networks and the media, they're looking for ad buys and they try to you know, get the candidates rather than focusing on the issues that will affect our lives. They would rather try to get them to fight and bicker amongst each other as if we're in a schoolyard. And it's, it's somewhat immature and it's below what our political discourse should be. Um, if you look at you know, the Republicans versus the Democratic debate, most of the speculation or most of the, of the commentary has been in regards to the viewership, not in regards to the issues. And we should be a, an electorate and a population, a country that's focused on issues more so than quote unquote popularity because we get the type of leader that we deserve based on why we cast our votes or who we cast those votes for. And, um, before I go any further with this, I want to introduce my guest for this week, um, Mr. Kareem Webb. Kareem is a L.A. native, a great businessman. Uh, he owns a bunch of restaurants in uh, Southern California, and he's also very active in the community. And I think that this is a young man that could possibly be one of the He's already a leader, but an elected leader in our in our city in the near future. I can easily see that. Maybe he even may have me on a ticket with him one day. We'll see. But uh, Kareem, say hi to the people. Hi to the people. Don't <laughs> and don't 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 wish that on me, Ron. I don't appreciate I know that. I, 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 I understand completely. So what I was going to say to get a little bit deeper into my little rant. I was looking at the debates, and we had Hillary, of course, the front runner. We had um, Bernie Sanders, who was just a tad behind her. Martin O'Malley, uh, Lincoln Chafee, and Jim Webb. And after Bernie and Hillary, there's a clear drop off when you look at O'Malley and, and Webb and Lincoln Chafee. I don't even know why Lincoln Chafee was up on the stage, um, but it makes me it always makes me wonder, you know. We're living in a TV age, and everything has to relate to how someone reacts on television and the issues themselves. The issues themselves can somehow be blinded or camouflaged based on the issues, I mean, based on the, the, the TV look or presentation or the sound bite. So, and you can chime in on this, Kareem. I just... We don't have much to choose from. Think about the presidential ticket right now. The only strong contender, strongest contender on the Democratic side, I would say, is Hillary and Bernie, both of who have served in elected or appointed office. But um, think about a Hillary versus Trump ticket. 
think about all the stuff that's going on. The president was on television today with the uh, uh, Korean, South Korean president. There's this stuff going on in the Middle East, all over the Middle East, in Syria and Israel, you know, with the stuff going on with the Russians. Um, in, in Afghanistan, we have to um, increase our troop amount in Afghanistan. Obviously, the things going on with ISIS and stuff going on with in, in Mexico in regards to immigration. We have no points on the globe right now in this day and age that's not affected with some sort of turmoil and for whatever reason right or wrong the eyes of the world in many uh, cases look towards our president for leadership so you have to think about that before you decide to pick your next leader could you see Donald Trump simultaneously juggling these balls between you know the the nuclear North Korea and their relations tension between South Korea and North Korea our constant back and forth with China the immigration problem with not only Mexico we just talk about Mexico because Mexico is our next neighbor but all up and down Latin America from Guatemala and and, and the crime sprees and everything going on with immigration then you talk about you know the TPP the trade deals then you talk about the wars going on you talk about all this stuff is so much stuff that's going on in the world and what are we paying attention to? We're paying attention to the most trivial, mundane things. What's your take on this? I definitely think we're distracted, but you know, we our our news outlets um, are similar to uh, to your point. Anything else that we might watch or see. So mm -hmm. the director and the producer really has the opportunity to kind of frame mm -hmm. um, what you have the opportunity to decide between. Yeah. Um, that's and, true and, that's a good point and so you know if i directed it, empire it would look a lot different than how it looks based upon who who's directing it mm -hmm. and uh if you and i were the writers so mm -hmm. um uh that's kind of what i think in terms of the perspective of the policy makers that we're that we're choosing between or the mm -hmm. folks that are running for office some aren't policy makers or don't have experience being mm -hmm. policy makers i think that uh I think that our eyes as, as a country is off the ball. I think in general, um, uh, you know, in, 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 in our country, um, we have a lot of young people that are undereducated and underloved. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, we, a lot of them are burdens on the taxpayer, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, our infrastructure is, is not competitive. Not at all. Um, you know, obviously we've got a, a major deficit situation and we're not talking about issues like, I mean, there's 400 million people in the, in the United States. Mm -hmm. There's 200 million Chinese colonizing the continent of Africa mm -hmm. right now. That's so true. So, so all the resources, uh, you know, the financial wherewithal that is going to come from that continent as it grows is not going to come back here. It's going to be going to China. That's and a very so good point. And the thing is that they have, um, they've mastered is they are building things. See, lots of times, you know, when we get foreign investment comes in with money and that money may go and is, is money is, is, is fluid. It can go places. It can be hidden, but the Chinese will go into Nigeria or some places like that and build a bridge and let you know the Chinese, we've built this bridge. They're adding to the infrastructure, which tends, you know, if they're improving and you know who's improving your infrastructure because you can see that every day, the roads that are paved that weren't once weren't paved, then you have a better relationship and you have a better sense of um, um, that this other entity has your best interests at heart. On the other hand, with us, when we give aid to many places, that aid, in many respects, goes to particular persons or parties, and it's just cash that can go anywhere. Mm -hmm. It's nothing that's solid. It's nothing that we build. In many cases, that money is mismanaged, mm -hmm. and it's not going into anything tangible. Well, that's true, but then the other you know, thing is we don't live there. Yeah. So we don't have two. I mean, we're talking about 200 million Chinese that live in Africa. Wow. And that their kids are going to live in their Africa and their grandkids are going to live in Africa. But wow. guess what? They're going to continue to be Chinese. Exactly. And so and they're going to control the wealth. So you, they're not going to Africa That's and then so they're poor. They're yeah. going to Africa 
they're creating business. Mm -hmm. They are and Europe. If you go to Italy and you want to go to the part of Italy where they make the best leathers in the world, the yeah. whole industry is run by Chinese wow. that are living in Italy. So you go all over the world mm -hmm. and you'll you'll know that whether it's Chinese or Indian or Brazilians, mm -hmm. it's not Americans being competitive. Uh. Right. And so our eye is off the ball in terms of our competitiveness. And we are bickering about uh, emails and uh, uh you know, you know, issues it's, that don't really that don't have anything to do with our competitiveness, the education of our young people, exactly. uh, the long term trajectory of our country, our financial now, why, viability. Why forward. do you think and, and what you're saying is is so obvious. Mm -hmm. It's so obvious. And you can see and like you said, you can look at different points in the world and you can see what's happening. But why is it that we're so blind to it? And I think that some of our leaders know that. Some of them do, and some of them, some of them are smart enough to articulate mm -hmm. that. But I think many of the smartest potential leaders decide not to get into politics because they don't want to deal with all the other stuff that comes along with it. Well, you know, when you have money in politics, <laughs> it's it. I mean, it's so simple. The yeah. people with the money are are creating the policy. Yeah. So if you've got money, we're selfish. Mm -hmm. It's human nature, right? Mm -hmm. So if I've got money and resources, mm -hmm. I'm going to say, screw the environment, mm -hmm. uh, screw fairness, screw. I mean, I might care about those things in general, yeah. but not as it pertains to what's in my best interest. It's capitalism. It's capitalism. And so, so you know, that's why you can mm -hmm. have one percent, less than one percent of the population controlling seventy percent of all of the wealth. Mm -hmm. You know, it's because they are influencing policy. They're buying the policymakers. And so it's 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 in the wealthies, it's to the wealthies advantage. Mm -hmm. It's in their interest mm -hmm. to keep us distracted. Absolutely. And that makes perfect yeah. and the thing is is that and I'm we're all capitalists and yeah. uh, but any anything that's pure, it's not really for the best of all. If it's pure now pure capitalism, pure unbridled Un unbridled capitalism is is not necessarily a good thing because it doesn't take into account human nature. Like you said, mm -hmm. you only compare yourself. You know, they, they was thinking that like the supply side economics it trickles down. That's assuming that people want it to trickle down. You only compare yourself to the people within your space. So if I made if I made three million a year but my next door neighbor is making 10, then I feel poor compared to the next door neighbor. I'm not worried about the guys that live you no know, further down the hill that I have no daily interaction with or very little d uh, daily interaction with that make 100,000 or mm -hmm. 50,000 a year. So that's not part of my orbit. Mm -hmm. So in my, I wanna keep what I have because in my orbit, my neighbor that's making 10 million is doing well and I'm only making two. So it's when you look at capitalism mm -hmm. run amok, then it can be uh, it can be an issue because it doesn't take into account human greed, and human greed can be it can be a bitch, you know. And it, it's true. And so you have to always keep in mind that we tend to make socialism a bad word, mm -hmm. but some of it is necessary in order for a civilized society to keep moving. You have to have those avenues towards upward economic advances and if you don't or even if you don't even have the illusion even the illusion is starting to leave now if you don't even have the illusion that maybe i can do this and i can do that and you throw out these different little anecdotal messages like if you have a lebron james who came out of poverty well, can everybody be lebron james mm -hmm. if you have some you know top-notch entertainer can everybody do that but all in all, it's always been preached to us, and I do still believe our best chances is with education, but we don't invest in education. Well, again, uh, you know, we have to take the money out of politics. Yeah. So until we take the money out of politics, our elected officials aren't going to make choice decisions and create policy How that is in the that? best interest. Uh, you know, that has got to be a decision that is going to be made by the citizenry of the United States. And that, I mean, that's, that's what it has to be. There's got to be a movement around taking money out of politics. But enough citizens have to be focused in and not be distracted in order to see what's really happening. Before I go further, um, callers, you can call in at any time. 
The phone number to call in is area code 323-843-2826. Again, 323-843-2826. When you call in, give me your name and the city you're calling from and uh, whatever comment or question. We'll give you 10 to 15 seconds to ask your question or make your comment. Again, 323-843-2826. We've been dealing with these distractions for a long time. I mean, if you look at, I mean, think about it. Think about our what we consider our, our best leaders. They were all flawed, but they didn't have to deal with the tabloid society. You go back to, I mean, this this got back from the beginning. This uh, Abraham Lincoln, a chronic, you know, uh, depressive. He was always depressed. You know, he had, you know, maybe bipolar or something. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Terrible marriage. Terrible marriage. Um just a, a train wreck in his mm-hmm. personal life. One, one, probably the greatest president we've ever had. We all know about the stuff with JFK. Think about the stuff even going back like Thomas Jefferson, who you know was a widower but was having affairs left and right and had romantic relationships with his slaves. I mean, many of our great leaders were still flawed. I really do believe that some of our potentially greatest minds that could enact certain policies that would be better for our country they are turned off by the entire political system they're turned off by the tabloid nature that our media has gone to because they need to compete compete with Mm -hmm. real tabloids they need to compete with tmz so now you see on cnn now they're talking about you know what's happening with lamar Odom and stuff before they didn't they wouldn't care about lamar Odom, but they see the stuff that's trending they want to get in on action and we take that same approach towards our policy makers you know wondering whether or not everybody knows like i said last week uh, i don't know if you've been keeping up with this whole benghazi trial mm-hmm. the Hillary. they everybody knows after seven hearings nothing's going up but they want to do it and the media knows the media knows there's been seven hearings nothing's happened but we're going to have an eighth because <laughs> we think that this can help you know right your poll yeah yeah. It's crazy. They got to sell conflict. So w- we get that. But in, in, in terms of the nuts and bolts, because in every state house, in every city, in every county, municipality, uh, in the U.S. Congress, um, bills are being brought up. Mm-hmm. And some bills are being passed and some aren't. Mm-hmm. And we don't we we don't see the fine print. We're not paying attention. Mm-hmm. And big business is, is by and large writing that legislation. And um, the regist- that legislation is, by and large, not in the best interest uh, of, you know, uh, our citi- citizen citizenry, mm-hmm. you know, moving forward. Uh, and it goes both ways. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, you know wealthy people and corporations that have um, interests, um, you know, push policy in their Absolutely. favor greatly. But, mm-hmm. you know, there's also a policy that comes down that benefits unions that's not in the best interest mm-hmm. of students or not in the best interest of, um, um, uh, you know, other constituents. You know, one thing, and I'm, I'm, for the most part, I'm, I'm pro-union, but I've always been pragmatic in this regard. Um, I think that they've swung the pendulum a little bit too far. Now, everything starts out of necessity. And at a time in our country's history when the employers were running amok and the workers Mm -hmm. had no rights whatsoever, then that was the birth of the unions and they did a good job and it helped create the middle class. But then, like, again, human nature and greed and mismanagement, then they started to go a little bit too far and to the point now there's a huge backlash against the unions, so they need to pare back. Somewhere there needs to be that, that proper balance and I know that they have they have strong unions in Germany, and they work well with the with the actual employers. You know what? Yeah. You know it gets down to right is right and wrong is wrong. Yeah. That's just what it is. Yeah. So if I, you know, I'm the chairman of the foundation at Los Angeles Southwest College, or so mm-hmm. uh, the predominant community college in South LA, mm-hmm. the hood. Mm-hmm. You go on campus, and you know we've got four hundred million dollars of beautiful new buildings. Our programs aren't up to par. We're working on it. Got a good president, mm-hmm. but she got professors and and 
vice presidents and folks that you can't fire. You can't mm. hold them accountable. Mm. So, yeah, is it good to be able to have a group that protects you from unfairness, that protects you in terms of your ability to, to get competitive wages, that mm-hmm. will advocate for you and your profession? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's what a union is supposed to be. But to get a lazy person that's not go. teaching, that's, that, that, that is not up to par, that's not meeting the requirements. Taking advantage of it. Taking advantage of yeah. a situation mm-hmm. and, and creating a less competitive situation for our kids and our tax dollars are paying for that, mm-hmm. that's BS. Yeah. So you got you to, gotta, you, gotta, you know, as uh, uh, what I would consider myself a progressive, you still got to be able to tell the truth. There you go. Yeah. That's, that's true. And that's the way it should be because, like I said, no – I think in our day and age that the nothing is is pure, right? Meaning that there's always something. There's nobody that's a hundred percent right in on everything. You know, as much as I love President Obama, I don't agree with everything he's done, of and I can not. still be a president. I can still you know support him. Yeah. Same thing with you no know, President George W. Bush. I didn't agree with a lot of things he did, but I did like the fact that he kind of spearheaded and, and increased funding for AIDS research in Africa tremendously. So it's, it's yin and yang. It's pros and cons to everybody. That's right. Yeah. Um, I was going to bring up, well, already brought up about the, the genuine people deal. But um, speaking about um, people and things that are going on, addiction. Addiction because of what's happened with Lamar Odom. That's been in the news quite a bit um, lately. And uh, this young man, who, who by all accounts, uh, uh, people that's known him because everybody's out in the media now. I understand he's doing better now too. I understand mm-hmm. he woke up from the coma. But, you know, addiction has touched many lives. You know, it's touched, you know, uh, my life in, in regards to the people I love and things of that sort. And um, it's a lot of people out there out there hurting. And if there's anything good that can be taken from this situation is basically, you know, if you're out there and you need help, you know you're not the only one. Even people with the means and resources of a Lamar Odom, um, he is still weak when it comes to that disease because many people think it's about willpower. They think it's that, you know, you just have to be strong. You're not strong enough. This person is sometimes it's not about strength. Sometimes it's really actually a disease that needs to be treated. But first, you have to recognize that there's a disease and you can't beat it with just your willpower. You have to really seek out the help and stay with it and respect the fact that it is a disease. I don't know if you've ever had to deal with any sort of addiction in your life and coming up, but I've, I've seen it firsthand and it can really affect families. But it doesn't affect anyone as much as it affects the person that's dealing with it. Uh, you, gratefully, it hasn't impacted my immediate family, mm-hmm. but it's definitely impacted, you know, the, my family, larger family mm-hmm. and friends and mm-hmm. business associates where you're, you know, making plans to do things with people that you think have the uh, the ability to show up and be consistent. Mm-hmm. And that disease, you know, prevents them from being able to do that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I have seen it uh, uh, up close and personal enough to have dealt with it with folks that I care a great deal about. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 a it's a booger, you know. When you when you st- look at the numbers and how it seems like addiction is uh, maybe because of prescription pills and things like that too. But the number of people that are becoming addicted on something that's been going up, and I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, essentially like depression. A lot of people are depressed. A lot of people are depressed for various reasons and things of that sort. But um, the key is this, like when I see someone that had, you know, he was a Laker and the way things uh, affected him when he got traded from the Lakers and, you know, he's dealing with the card. I mean, I don't think anything happened with Kanye because Kanye was already crazy. But it seems like every dude that gets caught up with the Kardashian goes crazy. It's something that, think about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about their brother, Caitlyn Jenner, Lamar, Chris Humphreys ain't had a good game since. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's the only one. I mean, like even Ray J ain't really, you know. So it's like any yeah. dude that gets caught up with them, I don't know what they're doing. 
But, I think with Mar, man, I mean, you know, we're all different. You know, you yeah. see people that, of means. You see people that, that probably came from really loving families that mm-hmm. end up having this issue. Yes, but with Lamar, I mean, you look at the tragedy that befell him in terms of his child yeah. that was killed at home. Yeah. Um, the tragedy with his father, he lost his father, I think, at, at, or his mother at 12 years old. Mm. His mother died, I think. As and his father was a heroin. Yeah, and his, his father, father was, was a heroin. So yeah. you're dealing with a, a underloved person who had a tremendous athletic gift, mm-hmm. right, um, who was, you know, being taken advantage of and used for his gift mm-hmm. to uh, uh, advance the cause of adults. Mm-hmm. Right. And I mean, that was his reality. Who do I trust? You know, when you saw uh, Lamar during the Laker days around town and you looked at his entourage, you know, the first thing that would come to your mind is not integrity and exactly and and upliftment. Yeah. Right. It's a lot of them like that. I mean, the entourage thing is is. I remember I was with um, I was with um, Irv one time. I was with Magic. Mm-hmm. It's one of the few times that I was I flew on his plane with him, and it was me and Mark Jackson. This was obviously before Mark became a coach and things mm-hmm. like that. And I was the youngest one on the plane, and I and my heart was beating so fast, Kareem. I mm-hmm. I, I tried to act like I belong, but mm-hmm. I really didn't because I was a young. I was playing on Magic Johnson's traveling team, and he was like playing cards. We were playing cards on his plane, and he was talking to me. He's like, Ron, I'm gonna tell you right now. At the end of the day, the only thing you have are your stories and your friendships, the stories and the friendships. He said, because once you leave the league and those checks stop, they stop. You don't get paid no more. They stop. And all the the girls, they stop calling. Then he said, and your entourage, they disappear. And he was saying, and so it's a shock to the system of a lot of guys when they thought they were just so loved. And he would tell me, no stuff about no. I mean, not to say too much, but he would just say that they found out the hard way mm-hmm. that when it's over, it's over. And I played some ball overseas, and I had me. I didn't make millions of dollars, and I still had an adjustment time to try to get myself out of my athlete mentality and get into the real world. And mm-hmm. it took me a while to get you know my bearings. So just think, if you played at the highest level. Mm. And then you have all the family issues and the personal issues mm-hmm. that he had. So that automatic depression Mm -hmm. of not doing what you have been defined as for most of your adult life and it's not easily translatable Mm -hmm. into an office job well and you're undereducated and you're undereducated and you're underdeveloped it's yeah right you've been since you've been bouncing the ball since yeah. Eight, nine, ten, eleven years old. Somebody else is doing your homework for you. The exactly. teacher was making an excuse for you. Exactly. Yeah, the whole That's world, so right? But part part the seas. You didn't have to step up as a human exactly. being and deal with the same, maybe personal adversity at home. But yeah. in terms of living life and going through your day to day, people are kind of parting the waves for you until all of a sudden they're it not. It stops exactly, yeah. and it stops suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. And you made all your money before you're thirty five. And now you got sixty or however many years left to a live lot of, with no skills. You know, um, on the show that I contributed on previously, uh, we spoke about that, and I had a you know Michael Latch. No, I don't. Great financial advisor, but he uh, you know, is a financial advisor for a lot of professional athletes. Well, um, Michael was uh, telling me one time. He's like, Ron, I was talking about some of these huge contracts, and these contracts are are huge. But he was telling me, though, that's a very, very macro gross number that they provide you in the media for a mm-hmm. contract. That's gross. That's mean that's everything. Right. And, and it, they kind of do that because it kind of adds to the sexiness of the league or the appeal of that player because they know that if a player's yeah. reported to get all this money, then people want to come see he must be that good. He's making all this money. But it's like, man, after you take out the taxes <laughs> – Manager's fees, agent fees, agent fees. You know, you probably have more cousins coming out the woodworks mm-hmm. than you ever had. And you know, until your grandmother, it could be your fifth or sixth cousin down mm-hmm. the road that's still your cousin. You get all this stuff coming at you. It's not as much as you think it is. It's now, not. still more than most people right. make, but it's not as much as you think to make at that early stage of your life. You get eight million bucks a year. It's four. Yeah, and then after the four. You got agent fees and this, that, and the other. Maybe the four is like three and a half. 
So, okay, you're getting three and a half for seven, eight, ten years, and you got 21 million bucks, but then you bought a house, and the house was four, and you have lived life a little bit. And, mm-hmm. and maybe you do or don't have a financial advisor that's trustworthy mm-hmm. and that's handling their business. Yeah. And then now you're 33 or 35, and you got 10, 12, 13 million dollars in the bank, but your lifestyle. There you go. Is and even more so than that, and the average. Um, NBA careers were four years, right? Yeah. And NFL is less than that. Yeah, right. So, and if you, you know have let's say you're making a four million dollars a year, yeah. Uh, now, and you bought a house that's commensurate to that. After you're done playing, you still got to pay property taxes on the house. You do. You still have to pay for upkeep on that house. Well, assuming you know, that you pay cash for it, because if you have a financial advisor, they'll talk yeah. to you about the tax ramifications yeah, of that. Exactly. And so, so, yeah, yeah it's, it's it's crazy. But yeah, but we wish the best for Lamar and um, and for anyone out there that may be dealing with um, or their family members or loved ones dealing with any sort of um, depression or uh, substance abuse issues to please go in and, and get help. So um, so as we go into the, the, the later round, oh yeah, also again, if you guys want to call in, you can call in at 323-843-2826. Again, 323-843-2826. So tell me a little bit about the stuff you're doing down in, in South L.A. Well, I'm a Buffalo Wild Wings franchisee. I have one uh, unit um, that's on Crenshaw and King, mm-hmm. which is uh, you know a historic di- district for you know, African Americans in L.A., mm-hmm. And uh, that store has really has been the catalyst for me doing a lot of other things in, mm-hmm. in and around South L.A. I'm the, uh, a spokesperson along with Lorenz Tate for uh, an initiative called Blooms, Building Lives of Opportunities and Options for Men. Fantastic. And uh, it's an initiative of the California Community Foundation, which is a great foundation. Mm-hmm. And um, it parallels uh, the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative. Okay. So we go after 14 to 18 year old um, African American boys, black boys in South LA that have had a brush with probation. Mm. So we um, um, get boys from probation officers who have um, you know recently been put on probation, mm-hmm. and our goal is to get them not to recidivate, don't end up going to prison, mm-hmm. graduate high school. We know that in South LA, black boys and brown boys, Hispanic boys who are um, one and a half generations in, mm-hmm. about 40% don't graduate high school. And out wow. of the ones that don't graduate high school, 90% end up going to big boy prison. Mm. But if they graduate high school, only 10% end up going. Really? Is that much of That's a the correlation? Difference. Wow. That's the difference. And so um, people who are educated, Mm-hmm. all of a sudden have more choices mm-hmm. you know, and they're exposed to more choices in the process of just getting through high school, mm-hmm. even in the conditions of some of the schools that are in South LA, which mm-hmm. I can tell you firsthand ain't good. Mm. It's not where I want to send my kid. It's not where you want to send yours. I mm. promise you that. Wow. Um, uh, but even getting through, through there, the, you know, that the, 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 the rate of young people that go to prison is, is reduced significantly. So, we work hard to do that. Then I'm the, as I spoke about earlier, chairman of uh, the foundation at Southwest College, and we work to bring resources, both financial and intellectual, mm-hmm. companies on campus that can um, 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 uh, uh, create curriculum with our professors that will benefit the students and and hopefully get students into careers. What kind of what are, kind of companies are, are you working with? Uh, you know, we've got uh, Elon Musk and, oh, and, really? and the good folks That's, there okay. Yeah, at uh, SpaceX. We're uh, working with U.S. Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're working in the, in the food industry and doing mm-hmm. something there. We've got some stuff in the entertainment industry with our dance program and with uh, uh, actually a guy you know, Shaquem, has recently been on campus okay. and we're talking about the possibility of doing some stuff with flavor units. So, mm-hmm. uh, and then there's a lot of other stuff. We've got child development center on campus. Um, and so we That's got 9,000 really students there. We got the capacity for mm-hmm. 15,000. So we want to grow, we're going to grow and, uh, just continue to have value. Give, give folks an opportunity to come. Most, almost 80% of the kids there don't pay for anything because of their economic status. And so you, you know, they're coming from South mm-hmm. LA can go to community college for free and then, either get a certificate or be prepared, uh, you know, to move on in a career, on a career path or 
transfer to a four-year university. So, how, how long has this program been in place? I've been a the chairman there since January. I've been mm-hmm. on that board for uh, a little over about a year and a half now. So you've been doing a lot since you've been there. It's a lot that you've kind of taken under your uh, your wing, so to speak, and and try to. Yo, Ryan, come on, man. I'm like you, bro. I'm not trying to be anywhere and don't do the work. We got to yeah, get, yeah, yeah. so yeah, get it done. So yeah, we do get it done. That's yeah. true. That's true. That's one thing. We are workers. That's it. We are workers. So that's that's really good. And, and have you? had an opportunity to see some of the fruits of your labor or has it been too soon? It's really kind of, we're at the beginning stages, yeah. like I said, January and it's, and it's, and it's a public institution. So yeah. it's a, a community college as a part of the Los Angeles community college district. And mm-hmm. so you've got to, again, you got to be able to navigate the yeah, bureaucracy absolutely. in order to get things done. Mm-hmm. But you know, we're in it for the long haul tomorrow to taste the soul, which is a 500,000 person, uh, uh, festival along Crenshaw come Boulevard. And check that out. Yeah, yeah, please do. Uh, Buffalo Wild Wings is 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 sponsoring the KJLA stage, and mm-hmm. we're doing after party. But all of the proceeds are going to benefit the organizations, the the, the, the College Foundation, mm-hmm. the Brotherhood Crusade, which is an amazing um, nonprofit in South LA that mm-hmm. that deals with um, young boys and girls of color. And is uh, that the the group I want to speak to? Yeah, well, I invited they, you out. Hey, they were. Thank you so much for yeah. inviting me to come and speak to these young men. These young fellows, um, each of them, I think I told you, I was impressed with them. You can tell that the work that the Brotherhood Crusade has been doing has been great work. Um, each of these young men came and, and looked me in the eye, shook my hand, mm-hmm. and, you know, I told them to quit calling me sir. Just call mm-hmm. me Ron, but I got the gray hair, so yeah. people think they need to call me <laughs> sir and have gray hair. But um, it, it was, I was impressed with the work that they're doing, and I was touched when they started talking about the things that they're going through at home, um, it's, 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 it'll, it'll wake you up. Man, I want to tell you quickly this story of one of these young mm-hmm. guys, which, and, uh, which was a bloomer, and they work. Mm-hmm. The Bloom program also you know, uh, supports the Brother Crusade, who does some of the Bloom work. Uh, uh, Samaje. Samaje was, he never met his father. His mother was a prostitute, mm-hmm. crack addict. At 12 years old, he started gangbanging, went to jail for the first time at 14. Mm-hmm. We got him when he was 16 years old into the Bloom program. Mm-hmm. Samaj is 19 now. So from 16 to 19, he went from somebody that wasn't going to school at all, was the total a, a dropout, to somebody that got his GED, mm-hmm. was working for me at Buffalo Wild Wings mm-hmm. over this last summer and was on campus at Cal Poly. This was his second year mm-hmm. at Cal Poly. When I saw him uh, about a month ago, Chris Paul, uh, God bless him, and his family were donating a hundred thousand dollar computer center at the Brotherhood Crusade. So, wow! Um, yeah. So I, I went to that event, and Samaje was there, and I hadn't seen him since the summer when he was working at one of the restaurants. Mm-hmm. And uh, the brother was speaking fluent Mandarin, so he's gone from being a total wow. dropout uh-huh. to speaking fluent Mandarin. And the sad part about his story is his one of his professors at Cal Poly had taken him to. Savannah, Georgia, to talk to law enforcement about alternative correctional, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and policing methods and really just tell his story about how he's overcome um, his upbringing to be where he is. Mm -hmm. And he met some young people that lured him to a part of town that, that, you know, and they tried to rob him and walking away just this last Sunday, man, he was shot and young brothers paralyzed from the waist down. I didn't get a chance to talk to him. Our young people are dealing with hell. You know, we we have war zones in uh, urban America and every urban city around the country. You know, you hear about Ferguson, you hear about Baltimore, and Chicago, w- Chicago, exactly. L.A., Miami, D.C., mm-hmm. New Orleans, Houston, you mm-hmm. name it. Uh, it's bad. It is. It's bad. And our young is. people, I mean, if you look at the numbers that get shot in all of these cities, mm-hmm. when you were talking, when we started off talking about the media and where the attention is, exactly. if this was anything other than poor black there and brown you go. boys, there you go. it would be front news, front page news exactly. every single day and the resources that we would throw at it mm-hmm. because it's thousands and thousands of lives that are being lost in these inner cities. And it is a kill zone. Mm-hmm. These kids can't afford to go home. They got you got kids that won't, can't go to certain schools because exactly. you got you can't drive through certain neighborhoods, and it is uh, it's it is. Uh, it's I've pitiful. always wondered, you know, and 
there's always been bad neighborhoods. And, I mean, many people think that the neighborhood I come from in Michigan was a bad neighborhood, but there was love. You know, and when we were coming up, it was still a sense of community. Even in the bad neighborhoods, you still had a sense of, of community, and, it was, and there was love. And you kind of knew who, you know, you better tread lightly around this person. Mm-hmm. He, he, he crazy. But mm-hmm. you knew what was going on in the hood and how to na- navigate. Mm-hmm. And But it seems as if even that certain bit of, of, of protocol or kind of, you know, established respect thing is – out the door now. It is out the door, and you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, I do. Know I mean, what you're we, yeah, about. you know, because there's, there's, no, there's no sense of community. Yeah, when, you know, when you're driving down, mm-hmm. you know, Vermont or Western mm-hmm. in the kill zone between. Uh, What's this hundred days, hundred nights thing I was hearing about? You, it, you know, it was BS. It wasn't really. Yeah, it was BS, yeah. but uh, uh, it didn't mean that kids stopped dying. Mm. It just means it, it wasn't worse than it was before it ever came out. So. Mm. You know, it came out. Somebody posted something on Instagram. A young man died in Compton. His girlfriend mm. posted something on Instagram with respect to the song, which is a popular song, mm-hmm. 100 Days, 100 Nights. And, a you know, a youngster gang member took that and said, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. But mm-hmm. they, the police, if you were to ask uh, uh, Chief Scott, who's the chief of the LAPD in the South Bureau, mm-hmm. um, he would tell you that, that – homicides never went up and they didn't really necessarily experience any targeted shootings as it related to 100 days and 100 nights so that mm-hmm. wasn't true however i mean if you look at the front page of the la times i think the monday before last we had 16 shootings in a mm-hmm. weekend in a very very small concentrated area it's just that is we it's a war zone mm-hmm. let's let's not you could call it anything other than what it, that's what we would call it anywhere else yeah i don't even know what to say to that i mean because if you think about it I don't see how in this in this country and the wealthiest country on on earth that we have we still have such a, a huge swath of our population and dare to say probably the most important part of our population now, which is the young youth, because they're the ones that are gonna, you know, drive who we are tomorrow. What's it gonna be? You know? What's it gonna be? You know, if you think about the the the, the racial makeup of this country, mm-hmm. how we're going to be a uh, minority majority in the next fifty years or so, but at the same time, if that mm-hmm. minority majority has to deal with these types of issues and is undereducated and things mm-hmm. of that sort, that means that even more so, the wealth is going to be concentrated. Mm-hmm. And I said this last week. When you have poor, destitute people, you're going to have those social problems because one follows the other. If you are well-fed and you're taking care of, the odds of you going out doing something stupid is pretty slim. Well, you know, my, my take on it is eventually, mm-hmm. you know, you, you, there's a lot of pressure on this system as it exists. Yeah. Right? And sooner or later, that pressure is going to pop. And we saw a small microcosm of this last summer. You mean like in on, on Ferguson and Baltimore? Yeah. So, okay. But in general, um, you know, these people that are poor, undereducated, and underloved are armed. Hmm. You know, so it, they're not going to keep pointing the guns at each other forever. Hmm. And wow. so, yeah, when you start having, like you said, it's like more like 2050. You're yeah. talking about 20, 25 or 30, 35 years from mm-hmm. now. Wow. You know, and the majority of the country is black, brown, yellow. Exactly. Right. And and there's a larger population of uh, a number mm-hmm. of them that are poor and disenfranchised and fed up. Wow. Angry. They're going to do something. Angry. And They're going to do something. So what, what can we do? I mean, the first thing, I've always said that one of our main priorities would, should be to fix the public education system. That would do so much to help, you know, cure some of the ills in our society. It's fix the public education system. Some people argue that, you know, it's not about the money because, uh, you know, we pay more Mm-hmm. per student then and then some people say it's about the t i think it's everything because whatever it is is not working but like you said if you have a properly educated youth that can see hope for their future mm-hmm. that's the key 
I I agree. I, I I again, I'm gonna keep coming back to this word, and the word is love. Yeah. Right. So if I go to a bad school, or I go to you know a school that doesn't offer as much, or I'm mm-hmm. a little less exposed, or I go to a place or mm-hmm. um, where that's gonna expose me to better things, mm-hmm. but I come home and I'm loved. Mm-hmm. Right. If you sat in that circle at the Brother Crusade yeah. and you asked those kids who loves you, I bet you half of them would not be able yeah, to tell you yes, one uh, person. Yeah. So if somebody don't love you. Yeah. How do you real. how do you justify loving yourself? Yeah. And if you don't love yourself, how can you care and don't have any how can you have self worth? Exactly. And if you don't have you know any worth for yourself, how can you have you know there you a, go. assign any worth to me? You cannot. Exactly. So uh, it starts with well, I've seen. So let let's go back to policy mm-hmm. and your original uh, in the intro into this time together today, talking about politics and mm-hmm. distractions. Hey, hold on just a second. I yeah. think we have a call coming in. Cool. Uh, caller, thank you for calling in. Can I have your name and where are you calling from? Oh, yes, this is Rachel. Hi, calling Rachel. from Atlanta. Hi, Rachel. How are you today? I'm doing wonderful. Hey, How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for calling in. Can I, uh, What do you want to add to this conversation? Actually, I, I, I wanted to add as far as the concern of what's going on nowadays with the population and the crisis that we're having with the youth, uh, noticing that the crime is increasing and it's a lot, the population is only getting younger. Mm-hmm. And the question is, it's a lot of talk about the issues and the problems, mm-hmm. but where's the action actually coming from? You know, who's actually taking action as far as people with money, celebrities, entertainers, mm-hmm. Um, if I had it, I sure would contribute mm-hmm. to that cause, um, build any type of a foundation program, mm-hmm. um, the community getting together to be able to form some type of program to get, you know, the, the youth involved. So it's all about a positive involvement to get them out of the street. And that is actually my concern. You know, so we can talk all day about these issues, but I commend to those that are actually taking action and doing something positive. Thank you, Rachel. So hopefully, you're welcome, okay, and you're doing a great job. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, and uh, call in any time. Rachel, I will made a, take care. Uh, Rachel made a good point. She made a good point in regards to those with the resources doing what they can, and everybody has their own you can't tell anybody what to do with their money. You know what I'm saying? Do what you want to do with your money. But it would benefit the the community as a whole if there was, and there may be, and we just don't know about it, if there was a, a bank, so to speak, mm-hmm. and this bank would, you know, do certain things that would help uplift certain communities, whether that's, you know, educational enhancement meaning this i've always said um that if the school system can't do it lots of times and i heard this at the with the brotherhood uh, group as well some dudes just want a, a place to be able to study and read i mean somebody said that they and it kind of broke my heart he he told me that he's trying to get his math grades up so he can do this and that but the lights were cut off so he couldn't study at mm-hmm. night and in the winter time it gets you know dark outside a lot sooner and he couldn't have any light, so he could. I mean, stuff like that. No if, Wi-Fi, period. No Wi-Fi? How can you get in the Internet? Exactly. How can you compete? Yeah. No, I, I think we do have a bank. Yeah. You know where the bank is? What is it? It's at the state. It's at the county. It's at the city, right? Because they'll, they'll, they'll spend the money. Mm. Cost costs 140 In L.A. County, the new juvenile camp that oh, is being man. built is going to cost about $200,000 per kid. The Brother of Crusade. You know, to to do the wraparound services and provide what was provided mm. for Samaje cost about seventeen thousand dollars a year, and they changed his life. Mm. So the money is there. It's about the policy, mm-hmm. so that you know, can the Brotherhood Crusade, Michael Lewis, who you met, who yeah. was running that thing, great guy. If the Brotherhood Crusade mm. could develop and have, you know, a hundred Michael Lewises, mm-hmm. right? Then instead of having you know eighty boys that are in this in this mm-hmm. program with them and doing a good job, maybe they could have 500. And then how many other Brother Crusades? It would be uh, uh, 
a, advantage to the taxpayer. Absolutely. As the taxpayer, why wouldn't I want to pay seventeen thousand versus two hundred thousand? And that's something that will that benefit that upfront investment. We will be you know seeing a return on that for years to come. Yeah, cause because now they will be in a better situation and to if when they get to the point where they're responsible young men and they start their own families they will have a different l- outlook on life and before that he worked for me this summer he was a taxpayer yeah so rather than taking from he was given to that's great and we got another call coming in caller thank you for calling can i have your name and the city you're calling from hi i'm Kay hugs i'm in indianapolis hi Kay. thank you for calling in um, the reason I'm calling is um, I'm hearing everything you're saying. Um, I like to backpedal to when you were talking about the media and politics and mm-hmm. how um, there's so much control, and now you're on the top of, of education mm-hmm. and the system. And um, something that I grew up with uh, in my education system and uh, spirituality is that everything starts with the mind and, and how the mind is trained. And um, I think my belief is that if there are more um, institutions that offer empowerment of the mind to give people the the will and the wherewithal to be able to uh, want to have better lives and want to make better decisions and want to infiltrate the politics system and the education system, then I believe that's how the situation can grow. And I really think that media plays a huge part in that because if you look at um, – um, the news, I call it the bad news. And, mm-hmm. But if there's more empowering type of statements, I believe that that would be more helpful to making change overall. I so, get, what is your take on that? It, uh, thank you for calling. K Hugs, right? Yes, that's okay, right. Okay, thank you for calling, K. Um, You're welcome. The the thing is, is that sadly we can't depend on the media. They they're driven by ratings. And unfortunately, we all know that bad news sells better than than good news. And so they're going to go for the stuff that uh, they think is going to bring eyeballs to the screen. And um, and, and it's not going to be good news. But I do take your point in regards to um, education and holding the media accountable. Now, there's a way that if there's a way that we could hold the media accountable by what we choose to consume, what we choose to put our likes to, then maybe that would make a difference. Do we have another call coming in? No. Okay. Okay. Well, listen, um, it looks like we're running out of time. So I want to thank Kareem again for joining us. It's been a very enlightening conversation. I learned a lot, and um, I didn't know that um, the Chinese were taking over Africa. Now, that's going to be cool. <laughs> you have a Chinese African. I like that. Um, thank, thank you to all the callers that called in. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, K-Hugs. And thank you, everybody, from around the country and around the world. Um, Feel free to um, uh, download the podcast. We're on iTunes. And I will be back with you again next week. Thank you again for calling. Thank you again for listening and viewing Focus with Ron Friars. And until next week, have a great night. Now that you found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com.